picking up now? On the microphone, how is it picking up? Uh, Pat usually, uh, well, he does. He comes and eats with us on Wednesday nights. And uh, he come in this evening, sat down, and he looked at me. And he said, have you got sunburned? But I said, <laughs> I was taking some treatments. I, we, we've decided we're going to discontinue it until after we get back from our trip on our 50th anniversary because the lady said you wouldn't enjoy your trip if you keep it up so it's some kind of uh, ointment that you put on and for precancerous I don't have it yet but they said I would if I kept it so and that's why I look this way and uh, I, I don't like it but you know I'm going to beat you next year so anyway that's what's wrong with me I'm not contagious so but I want to thank everyone here tonight. Um, Roger called me up and asked me if I could uh, teach the class again. And uh, he didn't tell me a lesson uh, topic, so I got to choose one that uh, I'm interested in. And to me, it's good to choose the one that you're interested in because there's a lot of studying and uh, prepping for it. And so uh, if you're not really interested in it, uh, that particular subject is kind of rough. But uh, this is one that uh, when I was in high school, I had all kinds of questions about it. And then all through, uh, you know, your life, you have questions. But we're going to look at some facts and examples of the work of angels in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, we're going to be discussing uh, some of the uh, different works that these angels do. Uh, Larry's been real helpful to me. He got me a, quite a few articles uh, in, from his personal library and uh, I've used a library upstairs and I don't think we make this comment enough but if you want to do any research we have a library that is has all kind of research materials in it and I think I would recommend you know to come over and just spend hours up there. Uh, there's some research materials you can't check out and others you can but it's a very good library over the years so uh, I recommend that highly but we want to look at angels and so that we can know a little bit more about them and uh, I don't think I'm going to cover any real specific detailed subject but I'm going to try to cover a good uh, variety of of information about angels. Um, there is still quite a bit that I want to study in the future and uh, be more comfortable with. So uh, I'll touch on some of those areas, but if you ask questions, I may have to say Larry <laughs> or Jim. We got both of them here tonight. Uh, but I feel comfortable that in a subject like this, that if I teach something that's not quite right, uh, we got Larry and Jim, and I know both of them in love will will handle it the right way and treat it because there is a lot of false information uh, in about angels, um, and so when we go to study God's word, we just have to read it, understand the context that it's in, and not try to make prejudgments on what we're reading uh, before we actually study it. I uh, want to be sure that everybody knows that uh, no angel that I have found, and I, I don't think I've searched for hard for it, but no angel has ever been identified as preaching the gospel to someone. That is not their function. They, they do not do that. Now, they're involved in the New Testament. We'll look at it, uh, some examples where they got the preacher and the sinner together as we call God's providence. So they are involved in some of those situations like that, but they, no angel has preached the gospel of Christ uh, because Jesus himself set that up, and we'll look at that in a little bit. So also that we have examples where they were ones that started to worship an angel, uh, and the angel stopped them very quick and said, get up, do not worship me. 
And so we want to be sure that we know that we remember that we only worship God, Romans chapter 1, verse 25, and Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. We also never pray to an angel or through an angel. As always, we pray in through Jesus Christ, our mediator to our Heavenly Father. Wanted to cover some, uh, I call them important points uh, of angels. Angels in uh, the New Testament, in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, uh, I think I can pronounce this one, Malachi, even though it's not spelt like the last book in the New Old Testament, but that's how it's pronounced. And that's uh, the Hebrew word for angel. And it means messenger, one who is sent. Uh, I've read some books on Brother Charles Hodge, and I like what he says. He says it's heaven's personal delivery service. And so you can see that whenever God wants something done, his uh, angels are the ones that carry that out for it. Some other biblical facts are that uh, angels are created. In Psalms chapter 148, We'll look at a few verses. We won't cover all the verses that I'll be using tonight, but in Psalms 148, and we'll look at, this is the other reason I don't do this, I, I lose my place in my notes. Uh, 148 verses 2 through 5. Praise Him, all His angels, Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters above the heavens. Let them praise his name for the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. Angels is right in that list of the host and the sun and the moon. So we know that angels were created by God uh, at, during this time. And also we're told that in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. If you read Job in chapter 38, around about verse 7, uh, you remember this, ver this chapter, Job uh, had been, I won't talk to God, I won't ask him questions. So God just showed up and said, I'll ask you some questions. And started asking him, where were you when the, uh, the earth, I mean, when the, Everything was measured and all of these. So, and it also in there says in those first five verses that the angels were created. So it indicates that the angels were created before the earth was created. And they are created, they do not die. So they were created one time and then they uh, live or have, they're not, they don't die. Uh, but it, it does indicate in Job that they were created before the earth was too. Angels are innumerable. Matthew chapter 26, verse 53. Uh, then we have also in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, it talks about the innumerable host of angels. Uh, angels are a distinct creation. They're neither God, human, or animals. They're a, um, a distinct creation. And there's a lot of uh, misconception uh, about uh, angels, um, if they're male or female. And I think I cover that later, too, uh, that we'll look at that. But quickly, uh, you can't study angels uh, or read the te Old and New Testament without coming up across the devil or Satan. So we'll cover a few points that I think is uh, important. And again, when you're studying, you have to re remember, as Roger says, it's very important to keep the context with what you're studying and don't jump to conclusions. Let it tell us what it's, because uh, we'll see here in a few minutes how the Bible is its best dictionary to explain stuff for us. Uh, we have the serpent introduced in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. And uh, it was cert the serpent that beguiled or deceived Eve. And then uh, later on we are introduced to a, the name devil. 
and he is the accuser or the slander. And something I learned is that it is also the proper name for the devil. I mean, for Satan. Uh, like my proper name is Reggie. So when you're reading the, the Bible, if you come across the devil, they say that's the proper name also of, ser of the serpent. Uh, we come across Satan in the New Testament, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 and following, where the 70 on a limited commission was sent out by Jesus. When they come back, they was all excited and happy and told Jesus, even Satan and the demons, uh, we have power over him. But Jesus said, that's not what you should be excited about. You should be excited that your names are written in the book of life. So this is important for us to see how Jesus looked at the fact of Satan and uh, that we should be happy about our names written in the book of life instead of we got power over Satan. Where he's also called the prince of the world in John chapter 12, verse 31. Uh, in Revelation, he's called the dragon. Let's turn to Revelations chapter 12. And this is where we'll see that the Bible is its best dictionary. Revelations chapter 12, verse 9. And we won't read too many of the verses before and after, but this is us uh, to keep in the context. It's uh, in the Revelation. Um, and we'll read uh, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old. So the dragon is called the serpent, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out of the earth. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So we can see that even in John and wrote in Revelation, he put all those names in one that it's the one person. Uh, so if somebody's talking about the serpent, devil, Satan, the prince of the world, the dragon, uh, this is the one. And he also has angels uh, that was cast out of heaven with him at the same time. Also, Satan means the adversary. Uh, in the New Testament, it means that he was the adversary uh, of God, Christ, and Christians. And uh, he was known, uh, referred to as the deceiver of nations. I think it's very interesting in, uh, of the temptations of Jesus by the different writers. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, uh, Matthew refers to it as the devil. He uses the name devil. Uh, then in a few verses, verse 10, uh, he uses the name Satan. And also verse 10 confirms again that we're only to worship our Lord, our God, and no one else, because that was one of the temptations that Satan gave Jesus. If you read Mark's account, he refers to him as Satan. If you read Luke's account, he refers as the devil. And so we see that the different writers refer to the different ones, uh, and Revelation puts them all in the same verse as the same one. Uh, we also, sometimes we hear that the, the angels that sin and fail, uh, they become Satan's angels. You may have heard that, you may have not, but they did. Uh, the angels that sin and fail uh, at that time, it says in Jude, chapter, or Jude verse 6 and 2 Peter uh, chapter 2 verse 4 that when they fail, God sent them to the darkness, put them in chains, and they were there until, in the future, Judgment Day. So they weren't able to go around and help Satan. Uh, when they fell, uh, they did not have another chance. They were sent straight to the torment. Uh, in Numbers chapter 22, we have here an angel of the Lord that is referred to as an adversary. So you keep in context, and you say, well, I thought the devil... Uh, the evil one was the adversary, but no, in the story of Balaam, uh, it even has the angel of, God, of the Lord drawing a sword. He was ready to use the sword in the story of Balaam. So we have a, a, just have to read it and keep it in context of which good angel or bad angel 
uh, that we have uh, in reference at that particular verses. I thought it'd be interesting to cover some old wise tales about angels. And this, I think, is probably what got my interest when I was in high school, is uh, you just hear everything about angels. And so these next few points, I'm always going to say that this is an old wise tale so that you don't get confused with uh, maybe not knowing that it's an old wise tale. I, I've heard this myself is that uh, you can't know anything about angels. Well, that's not true because we have the Bible that is uh, full of information about angels. And God put what he wanted us to know and it is our responsibility to know those things about angels because that's what God put in the Old and New Testament for us to learn about. So we can know about angels. How many books in the Bible mentions angels? Anybody know? Seven. Seven? <laughs> I figured that from you. No, 34 books of the Old and New Testament mentions angels. Um, how many in the Old Testament? 17. 17 books in the New Testament. Uh, this is the kind of information I like. Uh, so we can see that it's not an Old Testament nor a New Testament. They're both equal in reference to the angels. So we can and must be able to understand the work and the functions of the angels throughout the Bible. A study of the, and this is another wise tale, a uh, study of angels, angelology, is an Old Testament study. We live under the New Testament. And we just showed the figures is that they're in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, and they, people say this just because the old law was nailed to the cross. Well, they, angels were in, being taught about before the law was set up by Moses. And then they're in the New Testament after the law was done away with. So yes, um, it, they're in the both the new and the old. Um, how many, t and I won't ask, I'll just say, there was 108 times in the Old Testament the word angel or the that word is mentioned. In the New Testament, 186 times. So angels are mentioned more in the New Testament than in the Old Testament. And I think that's because God, Jesus used angels a lot in his ministry. And so uh, they are mentioned 186 times. Also, the New Testament has a lot about, uh, in Revelation, the second coming. And we'll see that they play a great part in the second coming. So they've been, their work has been throughout the, the Bible. Another old wise tale is that uh, angels are women. And I think this is just a romantic situation. I think all of us husbands have probably called their wives angels at some time. And uh, it's just, you know, it's just a, a flattery that we do. But they're not, and most of this we get from pictures of artists over the years have drew uh, and uh, their drawing of angels. How many names have we in the Bible of angels that's been named? Two? That's right. My, Gabriel and Michael. Michael is the archangel in Jude 9. And it's kind of strange that you read this. There's more told about Gabriel and what he's done than Michael the archangel. So, um, and I think, well, if we look at military set up, you've got the ones in charge, and as they come down, those down are the ones that do the work, and they're the ones mentioned mostly. So I think that's the way it's set up. Also, when we say that angels are women, they're not. Angels uh, are neither male nor female. They're sexless. And Jesus taught this in Matthew chapter 22, verses 29 through 32, and in Luke chapter 20, verses 35 through 37, when they were trying to trick him about whose wife is this lady going to be. She mar was married to all seven brothers. And he says, you do err not knowing the scripture because they neither give nor take marriage in heaven, 
they are like the angels. So the angels do not have uh, any way of reproducing. There's a lot of false teachings in the, in the world about angels being able to reproduce. Uh, they are created, they do not die, so they have no need to reproduce like humans do. Another old wise tale is angels have wings and play hearts. Uh, we don't have that written in, in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Again, artists have drawn a lot of the angels with wings and playing hearts, and it makes a real pretty glass stained window, but uh, it's not taught that in the scriptures. So we need to read and understand in context um, about how these things are done, and they do not have halos either. So uh, we, we can't find the angels described that way. The cherubim it has two sets of wings. Is it two? Uh, but the cherubim's uh, part of the temple uh, has wings, but regular angel, angels do not. Another old wise tale is angels are dead saints in heaven. Uh, and this is usually uh, done when the, the funeral for a young child uh, is, is held. Uh, they say another an uh, one of God's angels. Uh, the Bible teaches resurrection. It does not teach reincarnation. So when we die, regardless of the age, young or old, uh, we're uh, resurrected. We're not reincarnated into another being. Angels are, this is another wise tale, angels are to be worshipped. Uh, we pretty well covered that, uh, that we are not to worship anyone but God, and uh, both, it's always been taught that way. So we cannot uh, worship angels in any way. Uh, some people say in the old wise tale that angels do not have personal feelings. Uh, it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, they're curious. And then we have Luke chapter 15, verses 7 and 10. says that they care about humans. All the angels rejoice when a sinner repents. So they have feelings for humans uh, and in these regards of, of these scriptures that they talk about it. So they do care about man. And I think that's all the wise tales we're going to cover on. Uh, uh, and I'm sure y'all may have other questions, but... Uh, angels are to minister uh, to the saints. Uh, we have in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, angels ministering spirit, or ministering spirits. It says that they shall minister to the heirs of salvation. We're the heirs of salvation. Uh, we all, uh, if we remain faithful and do God's teachings, then we're heirs of salvation. And it does say in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, that they are ministering spirits for us. Um, angels, uh, if you look at when they minister, uh, one example, the best one that I know of is Jesus right after the temptation. He was in the desert 40 days and 40 nights without water or food. He come out and the devil tempted him three times and we know that story. And after, in verse 11, uh, it says the devil left. Then the angels came and ministered to him. So Jesus had already decided to resist Satan. He was successful in, reduce, redu, re, in uh, uh, not doing the, what the devil wanted him to. And after that was done, then the angels came and ministered unto him. Uh, we don't need to you know, guess what they did. Uh, but I, I always think about, you know, 40 days and 40 nights without fe eating. I don't think I can go 40 minutes without eating. So, uh, But we can imagine uh, what the angels' opportunities they had to minister unto Jesus at that time. So that was how they did it. After the event, they were able to, they come and ministered unto him. In Luke chapter 16, uh, this, this one to me is a very important part about ministering. Um, in Luke chapter 16, we have the 
uh, parable, but I think as most ones believe that this is a true event, it uh, teaches a truth that we need to understand as Christians. Uh, the angels in this, they carried, I uh, uh, can't even think of the name, <laughs> I have to look at it, but Lazarus. Uh, they carried Lazarus after he passed away, the saints carried him into Haiti world of the saints. And so uh, we know that Lazarus was a beggar. He had sores. And so he had nobody to comfort him. But when he died, he was carried uh, uh, into heaven and the, prepared for the saints uh, of, that worship God. It says that the rich man died and was buried. So he didn't have any uh, angels administering to him. And I think this is a, a, an important point, especially uh, with all the news on the uh, radios and the TV today about the Wade versus Roe uh, problems that we're having. Uh, I had not realized it was back in 1973 when this was passed. And I got to thinking about the way the saints are carried from death to uh, Abraham's bosom, and I got to looking up, and it said they were 65 estimated, 65 million aborted babies during this time frame, from 73 till now. How they got that number, I don't know, but you know, it, well above you know anything that we can imagine. <laughs> and I can't say that ever. I don't have any idea about how the mother felt. But I can just imagine in my own heart uh, a baby, you know, being aborted at, this, at the time of their life. And as Christians, we teach, rightfully so, that once conceived, that person is a soul. And they may not be accountable uh, knowing their sins or not, but they are a soul. And to be aborted, uh, this verse here, they're not alone. An angel will carry them to heaven. And uh, so, you know, when we hear these numbers and these figures, uh, we can't put a face on them and we can't understand. I also think about all the children um, losing their lives in Ukraine. And uh, they, they don't have to be the age of accountability. Uh, but if they die, then their, their, their souls are going to be taken uh, carried with the angels so the angels still ministers to us in ways that we may not know or understand but we have these examples and uh, it's, it's very comforting to me and I think it should be to all Christians to know that uh, we, we pass by ourselves uh, in, to death and to eternity uh, but the ministering spirits will be there for us uh, they are angels Let's look at Mark chapter 16 real quick. We want to look a little bit at some of Jesus' teachings that we will make reference to. Um, I got to get to six, chapter 16. Jesus set up the way that men are to be saved, uh, how that we are to hear the word. Uh, in verse 15, he said unto his apostles, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Jesus set this up in process of, of how uh, a lost person hears the gospel. Is he says that you, talking about the leaven, are to go and preach. And then they were to teach the ones they teach to go and teach others. And so this is how God had it set up man to man. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, uh, we're referred to as earthen vessels. So this is how Jesus has it set up. Then I want us to look at the conversion of Saul and understand that... Um, 
this was Saul uh, after Jesus had gone to heaven. Uh, he appeared to Jesus. And the reason we're taught in, the, in Acts chapter 9 uh, is that uh, Saul had to see Jesus physically in order to fulfill the requirements of being an apostle. And if you study, read that, nowhere in there does it tell that Jesus told Saul how to get his sins forgiven. He just said, you go to Damascus and it'll be told you what to do. So Saul, even after he saw Jesus, he did not know what he had to do to be saved. And so then later we read uh, when he met uh, in, in Damascus, he was told what to do. But I thought it was interesting that even Jesus didn't go around his plan of having man preach the gospel to men himself, ourselves. And so this should be a motivator that angels or nor Jesus is going to tell someone now, today, how to be saved it is our responsibility. Angels did get involved in bringing the two together in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius was a Gentile. An angel appeared unto him in a vision and said, you send to Joppa. And so when they sent to Joppa, uh, Peter came. And so we see that man preached the gospel of Christ to other men. Uh, we also have some other examples of where angels uh, were involved. Um, Peter uh, also was, was told to go to uh, uh, in the desert where uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was waiting or riding in his chariot. So this angel helped get these together. Uh, the angel did not tell uh, the Ethiopian eunuch what he needed to do. It was a man that told him. opportunity for and it's also taught I didn't have this in the notes but it's also taught when we get to heaven we're joint heirs with Christ uh, today we're below the angels in just the scheme of, of the way that God has it set up but when we get to heaven we're uh, joint heirs with Jesus so we're above the angels in heaven and one of the books that I was reading asked that same question. Do you think the angels are, would be jealous because they have no Savior? You know, they were created. And uh, so it's, it's like you said, a situation that they don't have that opportunity. Um, yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, information like that. But getting back to Peter, uh, that he was instructed by an angel to go to the, uh, um, the Ethiopian unit. Uh, and, and one of the subjects we'll talk about is uh, uh, the uh, subject of being of, uh, let me get my notes here, of providence of God. Uh, we also a lot of times look at the Ethiopian unit that he would be carrying the gospel to uh, Egypt. All right. Uh, Ethiopia and that is true and that's part of God's providence uh, in that the reason that the Ethiopian eunuch was uh, preached to but also I feel that that teaches us a lesson that if somebody is really searching for God uh, even in today's we can, they can find him in Acts chapter 8 verses 26 uh, the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying arise and go to the south and we've, we've talked about that uh, that he was able to be involved that the angels brought the two together but that's as far as they went uh, in bringing uh, the, those together the second coming we all love to think about the second coming and uh, the angels have a part in the second coming uh, they have a big part in the second coming 
And Jesus, uh, in the, the Gospels, taught about the second coming and about the angels uh, being involved in it. Acts chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, uh, we're told that the apostles, that Jesus would return in the same manner that he went up in the, at the second coming. And I love this story about it because while the leaven was looking at Jesus going up into the cloud, uh, just the attitude of the two angels, uh, their statement, why stand ye? You know, why are you standing here? Get about the Lord's business. You know, he's going to come again just the same way as he went up. And so uh, the two men in white apparel had this question for the apostles. And uh, I thought it was, it was kind of interesting the way he said it, just why stand you gazing? You know, we got work to do. But from Acts all the way through Revelations, we have everything getting ready for the second coming. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flame and fire taking vengeance on those who do know, not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the angels will, angels will be assisting Jesus on the day of his return, just as uh, in Thessalonians, uh, Second Thessalonians describes it there. Uh, in Matthew chapter 13, uh, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Uh, again, the Bible is the best definition of itself. Uh, Jesus describes the uh, parable uh, to his apostles. Uh, and he says in verse 39, the angels are the reapers. They'll be separating the tares uh, from the wheat. And this is the angels. And uh, in the book of Revelations, we have the, the picture of the angels setting the sinners on the left and the, uh, the, the saints on the right. So they have their part uh, that God has well planned it. I want to conclude on... Uh, this part here I'm still studying on and I want to make some observations on it, but um, the providence of God, uh, you, to me, you can't study angels uh, without studying the providence of God too. It's a, a combination that is there. Angels uh, do the work of God uh, throughout the Old and the New Testament when uh, God uses them to go through there. Um, Brother Roger, uh, even Sunday morning, used the term uh, providence of God when he was talking about the military uh, soldier that was able to come back. So it's something that we should know and use and understand. Uh, our prayers on Sunday morning and, and Wednesday nights and all, uh, we use the terms that mean the providence of God. Uh, we say, you know, give the preacher a ready recollection of the studies that he has studied. I needed that tonight. Um, and we, we say, God, you know, guard, guide, and direct us. Uh, we teach very right so uh, that, you know, prayer is effective. How? You know, we need to understand providence of God for that. Uh, in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, where the, he was talking the example of someone saying, well, I'm going to go to this city and make a lot of money next year. Uh, James says, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, I will go do this and do that. Uh, providence is always looking back. It's not looking forward uh, to be able to understand what particular event happened. Um, the best way I know to describe this um, that I have found is the two definitions of miracle and providence. Miracles have ceased uh, in the New Testament. The apostles that were able to lay on hands and pass on um, gifts of miracles to prove that those people were preaching the correct gospel. So since they have passed away, we don't have miracles. 
but a good definition when we're studying the Bible is providence implores a supernatural source by a natural means. And we'll look at an example here in a minute. Miracles use both supernatural source and a supernatural means. What I mean by that is Joseph in the Old Testament, uh, he was you know, betrayed by his brothers, he was put in a pit, he was sold, he was betrayed, he served time in jail, he was lied against, and come out on the end, one of the great servants of God. Uh, he looked back when he was confronting his brothers and said, don't feel guilty about this, this is because of God. So Providence was looking back at what happened and knowing that that was God's will working in that. He was using a supernatural with regular natural means. Miracle, real quick, is look in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, verse 4, where the, the Spirit sat upon them with tongues and they were able to speak in tongues. That was the uh, supernatural, was the Holy Spirit source. And what they did was speak in tongues that they did not know. And that was the miracle using the supernatural means. That has ceased uh, in the books. Also, real quick, Peter, uh, in Acts chapter 3, him and John were going into the temple. There was a lame man, and the lame man wanted money. And, of course, Peter said, I don't have any money, but I will give you what I have. And so he said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And so Peter gave Jesus the credit and he, when he told the man to get up and to walk. And Jesus was the supernatural source and the supernatural means was the man was able to get up and to walk. And so to me, when you think of these and you're reading and studying the Bible, to me those help. I appreciate everybody's kind attendance. I appreciate the comments and... Uh, I think class is over, so thank you.
It is time to get our service. If you're visiting with us, thank you. You're our honored guest, and we hope to see you again. We ask that you take a moment to fill out one of the green cards on the back of the pew in front of you and leave it where you're seated. We ask that anyone who has a cell phone or noise-making device, please silence it to not cause any disruptions. For announcements for sick or in the hospital, Carla Cass is confined at home with injuries. Mark Lance in Chalmette, Louisiana is having back surgery on Monday, May 23rd, and requests our prayers. Melissa Shirley requests prayers for Becky Wheeler. She is suffering with brain cancer and is at home with hospice care. Teresa Tatum requests prayers for Steve's sister, Teresa, and her husband, Grady Loveless. She is having surgery tomorrow, and he is dealing with cancer. Steve and Teresa also request prayers for their health problems. And we ask that you see our bulletin for a list of our shut-ins and those with ongoing health issues. For general announcements, we are participating in a commodity drive for the Tennessee's Children Home through May 22nd. A list of needed items is posted on the bulletin board in the foyer. And our Vacation Bible School is scheduled for Saturday, June 18th. For order of services, first prayer is by Les Clark, closing prayer by Josh Perry, script reading by Alex Clark, and song leading by Andrew Cass. Thank you. Yes? Oh, okay. Uh, Becky Wheeler has passed away today. Okay. Thank you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly bow at this time at the close of this day, thankful for your care, thankful for your providence. We recognize thee as the creator and we offer our praise and worship to thee and hope that it is in accordance with thy will. We're mindful of those of our number that have been mentioned as sick and shut in. We pray that you would be with them, that they would receive the care that they need and soon return to be with us. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give us strength and wisdom to do your will and be with the works that we carry forth in this place. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good evening. The invitation song tonight following the lesson will be number eight. Number eight will be the invitation song tonight. And before that, we will sing number 76. Number 76. Number 76, all three verses. Walking in sunlight,
scripture reading tonight will be from the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians in chapter 3. Philippians in chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Philippians 3, starting in verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Well, hello. How are you? Here's a riddle for you. We create them, yet we despise them. As soon as they appear, we can't wait to be rid of them. What are they? Regrets. God created humans with freedom of choice. God created us, but we create regret. Regrets occur often coming in all shapes, sizes, and forms. Relatively few days are void of regrets, but gratefully, most are insignificant in the scope of having a lasting Im impact on our lives. We may regret eating that extra helping of dessert at the potluck as we later attempt to fit in our clothes, or maybe we regret not using our time more wisely and having to scramble to get our work or homework done on time. However, other regrets are not so easily overcome and produce great difficulties. Words that we speak in haste can cause immediate hurt and affect relationships with family or friends. Actions motivated by jealousy and pride bring remorse as they backfire and hurt those we love most. Gossip is powerful enough to crush spirits and create great divides. Since regret can be very prob problematic, why is it we humans create so much of it? Because regret is a tricky little thing, clearly visible only when looking behind. By the time our past actions come into clear focus, it's too late to avoid them. Those deeds, good or bad, have already formed a place in our story. We can be thankful, however, for Paul's story recorded in the Bible. If anyone modeled a life lived beyond regrets, it was Paul. His past was filled with all things regrettable. But once a Christian, Paul realized his past lay in direct opposition to his future in Christ. So Paul's focus changed and he forged ahead in his new life. Although Paul wrote of forgetting his past, we know from scripture he never disregarded his former life. He referenced it as he spoke and wrote his epistles of encouragement. But Paul chose not to live in accordance with his memories. Instead, he used his past to fuel his future kingdom work. At some point, our actions will guarantee us regret, requiring we bring it before God and make amends to those we have hurt. We may, then we may store our regret in the past where it belongs, using it only as fuel to live out the productive life God asks us to live. Our heavenly prize does not lie behind. It lies ahead in Christ Jesus. If there's anyone here tonight that needs the prayers of the church or recognizes the need to become a Christian, Please come forward as we stand and sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing cup? Are you washing the
sing the first verse of number six, and then we'll be led in closing prayer. First verse of number six. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Please bow with me. Dear God, we are so uh, very thankful that we've had this opportunity to come uh, midweek and worship in your name and to gain more knowledge from you. We ask that you uh, be with all those who are mentioned in our uh, announcements, those who were uh, sick, recovering from injury, those who are shut in. We want to remember all of those who are uh, unable to be here and that we do what we can for them. And we also pray for those who have chosen not to be here, that they will make decisions which are better and that we may be able to uh, talk to them and teach them and uh, that they might gain uh, more uh, ability to uh, desire to come and worship with you. We know there are many things that can keep us away from you. We, um, we pray that we're able to uh, guard ourselves against those things and to avoid those temptations. We ask that you be with us as we leave here tonight, uh, that we conduct ourselves as Christians uh, wherever we go. And in Christ we pray. Amen.